And so, my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. <laughs> Friends, everywhere, wherever you're tuning in from El Paso, Fayetteville, Houston, Fort Worth, yeah, get excited. We are continuing the series, Divided States of America, week two, as we are launching into uh, just a conversation around some key issues and divisive issues in our country. And what's a Christian perspective and how do we think about these things and, and what's the appropriate biblical lens to think through. And so let me start by framing up our, uh, our time together by, by a little bit of a story. Uh, before we started Awaken Conference, we used to do something called Launch Retreat. Launch Retreat... Get excited, was out at a camp, Sky Ranch, Van, Texas, and every year we'd have a different theme, thousand young adults, party by the lake, really fun weekend. One year, our theme was party in the USA, launch party in the USA. And so we went through just the nines on, hey, we got to have decked out America, USA, all this different, you know, gear, decorations, everything. And what else do you need to have if your theme for a huge party at a weekend is party in the USA? That's right, a bald eagle. So I thought... How do you find a bald eagle? Turns out they're not as easy as you would think, but that didn't stop me. I'm not a quitter. I'm an American, party in the USA. So I decided, man, we're going to go full tilt all about getting a bald eagle. Called up a bunch of different places and they were like, yeah, that'll be 50 grand. It was like, okay, that's not happening. And then I uh, was told as I was calling someone that there was a wildlife preservation group in East Texas near the retreat location that had recently rescued that's right, a bald eagle. So I got a hold of their phone number, called them up, explained, yes, I'm a pastor, but I'd like to see your eagle. And, uh, and walked through that and the guy was like, I can't bring you the bald eagle. I, in order for us to do anything with it, even for us to go rescue it, we had to get a permit from the United States government because these are such restricted, protected animals that you can't even approach one, you can't go up to one, you can't touch one, even if you're out in the wild without risking getting a fine. In other words, if you're walking along and out in the, you know, you're camping one day in the wilderness, you stumble upon a bald eagle nest. If you decide, man, I'm going to take a selfie right here with this bald eagle. The government, if they find that selfie, is going to find you and fine you up to $250,000 and five years in prison. Think about that. Now, this has actually happened. People have actually gone to prison for messing with a bald eagle egg or a bald eagle nest. Can you? Think about that. Can you imagine being in prison? Everyone's going around at the lunch, you know, trays and telling them about what they're in for. And yeah, I robbed a bank. I knocked a guy off. And the other guy's like, yeah, I took a selfie with a bald eagle egg and now I'm in prison. (laughs) How bad is that story? Well, how did that law get passed? There was a group that decided, hey, we think that because it's an endangered species, we need to pass legislation and advocate and raise our voice and have elected officials pass laws that protect bald eagles and bald eagle eggs. What does that have to do with what we're talking about tonight? Tonight, we're going to move into a divisive topic in our country that is related to the protection of rights on both sides. In other words, a divisive issue in our country right now is around the conversation or the issue of abortion or pro-life and pro-choice. The rights of the unborn versus the rights of the woman. And let me say up front, because immediately, even saying that word, I, I just know it's such a loaded term. And some of you, even the word abortion, you're flooded with shame, guilt, and condemnation. And I want to make abundantly clear, those emotions are not from the Lord. If you were a Christian, that doesn't define you. No sin is greater in terms of the fact that all sin and all of us, any sin in our life, require the death of Jesus. So if in the next little bit you feel any amount of shame and condemnation and any of that beaten over the head, that's not where we're going, and that is not from the Lord. That is from Satan. Uh, additionally, the term triggers a bunch of people going, hey, I don't, you guys don't talk nearly enough about this issue. And so we're going to venture into a tricky topic and just talk through what does it look like to be pro-life versus pro-choice or pro the rights of the unborn and, and some would say pro 
the rights of the women. And the reason I say it's tricky is there's a lot of energy around this issue and Christians will have a lot of energy around this issue and you'll be not cool with abortion, but you're totally cool with sleeping with your girlfriend. And you know that's what leads to an unplanned pregnancy, right? And so just as we move into this conversation, I want us to look through the lens of what does God's word say about this topic? How should we respond and how do we just stay informed and how do we be advocates for life, period? So we're gonna walk through three ideas as it relates to this topic, three questions. And uh, the first one is around when does life start? There's a common uh, terminology or phrase that's out there that, hey, it's just a clump of cells up to a certain point. So we're gonna just talk through and uh, begin the discussion and evaluate when does life start? Like when does it move from being an embryo or something more into actually a human life? It's a crucial question to begin to ask. But before I go into that, I wanna invite to the stage a couple of friends of mine, hold on before they come. Uh, This is Lauren and Jordan. Lauren and Jordan um, are 20 weeks pregnant they have not had a sonogram because of COVID. They are about to have their very first sonogram, find out what their baby looks like on the stage right now. So they, you guys can come up and they're with Farah and Meredith from Thrive. Thrive is a ministry that helps with, uh, just unplanned pregnancies and couples that are walking through that and women that are walking through that. And so they're gonna be getting ready and I'm gonna walk through and we'll keep talking over here, but they're gonna be getting ready. But this is Lauren and Jordan and they, how exciting is this? Are about to see their baby for the very first time. Goosebumps. You got your money's worth. But while they're getting all set up, I want to walk through and let's just talk about when does life begin? Is it just a clump of cells? Is it just a clump of cells? Right. So that's the first question I want to walk through as they're getting ready. According to Princeton University, at conception, A baby's sex, hair color, eye color, essentially all of its DNA are present from the very moment of conception. In fact, uh, uh, further studies have shown that at the moment of conception, sperm, egg, meat, there's a flash of light. And from that moment, all of the baby's unique DNA, hair color, eye color, everything is fixed for the rest of their life. According to the Mayo Clinic, in the first trimester, first 13 weeks, a baby's toes, fingernails, nose, head, hormones, and heart begin to beat. 21 days after conception, you can detect the heartbeat of the baby. It will beat 54 million times between now and when it's born. And you can detect the heartbeat. At six weeks, you can detect brain waves that are functioning inside of the child's brain. At eight weeks into pregnancy, the baby will begin to express uh, through touching. It'll be squinting, jaw movement, grasping motions, thumb sucking at eight weeks in, toe pointing, and can even smile at you. This is just from secular biology. This is what we know in terms of research. At nine weeks, the baby has fully developed its own set of fingerprints. A doctor around this time can identify the sex of the baby, and the baby's even now producing its own reproductive cells. If it's a girl, she's already developing her uterus and ovaries that will have the eggs that will carry or have the children that if she has children, will be there for the rest of her life. By the end of the first trimester, the fetus has every organ. Fetus, by the way, is a word that we think means something. It means offspring. It's a Latin word for offspring. At the end of the first trimester, it has every organ it will have throughout its entire life. At 12 weeks, the baby can actually cry in the womb. At week 13, it can feel pain and will try to move away from any procedures or doctors or anything that is happening as people move in whether that's an abortion or another procedure. 95% of biologists in America believe that life begins at conception. So just as we're talking about this, it's just what biology says. I'm not saying it's what you have to believe. It's just what biology is pointing out what they believe. And uh, how's it going back there, guys? Awesome. Yeah? Oh, they just saw it's a baby girl. Go on, ladies! Um, hey, you, you tell me. You tell me whenever you're ready. Yeah. Are you ready? Sure. Man, let's do this. Get the popcorn ready. Come on. The suspense is just, oh, there. Oh. So what are we looking at? Oh, my goodness. So is that her head? 
so I'm clearly an expert in heartbeat. this. Heartbeat. This is the baby's heartbeat. Go ahead. It's a heartbeat. 20 weeks old. And that heart has been beating since it was three weeks old. Come on. And as you move it around, for those of us, for, for them, <laughs> who can't understand what it is, uh, where, what are we looking? So what we're looking at right now, that's the baby's face. So up Farrah's against. gonna point up, yep, that's the baby's nose, there's the baby's eyes right there. You'll see the stomach is a little round circle. So oh, wow. uh, babies swallow the amniotic fluid. So it's important for us to see that stomach right there. And that happens in the first trimester, nine to 10 weeks. Wow. Um, baby's feet, so baby's pretty much folded in half right now. The, the legs are all the way up by this the head. Feet? Oh my goodness. <laughs> so there's the feet. Are those your feet, Jordan? Huge. They're huge. Huge feet. <laughs> yeah, definitely. So as a baby girl, um, by 16 weeks, she has all of her ovaries. I mean, all of her eggs in her ovaries by 16 weeks. Wow. Yep. So pretty amazing. And that's the heart beating. That's the, the heart beating. Yes. It's amazing. Yeah. Pretty amazing. It's amazing. Let's show 3D. Yeah, we're going to get to a 3D. This machine is a, amazing. So it shows moms um, when they come in for these sonograms. It gives 3D and 4D images. And I got to tell you, as great as sonogram machines are, we see babies that are the size of a poppy seed. So when a baby's heart is beating for the first time, we can see that on sonogram, and it's the size of a poppy seed. Wow. That's tiny. Remember when you get a hamburger and it's got the little poppy seeds? That baby's heart's already beating. It already has a spinal cord. It's already got the hand and foot plates ready to um, form its hands and feet. Um, it's just amazing. So this is a 3D, and it all depends on the, the direction the baby's pointing. Um, there's the nose and the eyes. Little mouth right there. It's amazing. How you doing, Jordan? I'm, I'm great. Yeah? How you doing, Mom? Yeah. So they'll get pictures of all this oh, to take with them. that is amazing. Yeah, it's pretty sweet. So this is life. And so this is, this is 20 weeks. It's amazing. Man, hey, will you guys give it up for Thrive and Jordan and Laura? Awesome. Okay. You done? You're going to talk about this is the age of... Yeah, you go. Yeah. So I think one of the hard things um, right now to think about is this baby has all of its organs. It's fully developed. It's now just going to grow until it's born. And this is the age that you can still have an abortion in Texas and most states. So all the way up to 21 weeks and six days can a mom have an, can a mom have an abortion. And... Um, I think David's gonna talk more about that later, but just to kind of give that impact of what's going on um, in our culture, in our country today, and kind of to speak to what you're talking about, what we're voting for. Awesome. Yep, so. Man, well thank you guys. Thank you yeah. all so much for being here. Amazing. Mm -hmm. and thank you, Lauren. I feel like she has to be named The Porch or something now. <laughs> it feels. Oh, Meredith, that's right. Awesome. Hey, let me keep going. If y'all, uh, I'm fighting every girl's attention on the foot up there, I'm sure, right now, but I'm going to keep driving. So that's what biology shows us. But what does God's word say about this? In Psalm 139, David writes and describes how God's relationship with him began and where it began. And he says this in Psalm 139, verse 13 through 16. God, you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb, when I was that size. I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful, and I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came yet to be. David says God was weaving him together like he wove you together, your personality, your hair color, everything about you was being formed 
all in the womb. You're extroverted because God formed you that way. You're introverted because he formed you. You have brown hair, uh, not just because you dyed it, but because originally God wove you together and he formed you in your mother's womb and fixed those things. Jeremiah chapter one, verse five says that before I formed you in the womb, God to Jeremiah, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. In Exodus chapter 21, verse 22 through 25, it describes that if two men get into a fight and they accidentally hit a pregnant woman and it does damage or takes the life of the baby, the life of the person who did that action is required. It says this, if two people are fighting and they hit a pregnant woman and she gives birth prematurely and there's no injury, the offender must be fined whatever the husband demands and court allows. But if there is serious injury and you take, you are to take life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. Burn for burn, wound for wound, bruise for bruise. Exodus says it is a child in the womb, even legally in the state of Texas. And again, listen to me very closely. If you feel shame and condemnation, that is not the voice of the Lord. I'll explain even more of that here in a second. But if you're feeling those things, if you have trusted in Christ, those don't define you, and you can be free from that, And all of us are sinners. And yet we have to have an important conversation about a really key issue. Even legally, we have crossed the threshold. Where as a nation, in 38 states, we inconsistently, while we allow that she could go drive right now and have an abortion, if on the way to that abortion clinic, Jordan and her get in a wreck and are hit by a drunk driver that's on the way there and it ends up killing Lauren and the baby. Legally, it would be a double homicide. Where even legally we go, yep, it's a life. And we have crossed the threshold. And the Bible and biology seem to be clear. Life begins at conception. The second question that's often asked is, maybe not, well, you know, is it alive or is it not alive or is it just a clump of cells? It's not maybe a clump of cells, but it's still, it's in her body. It's her choice. So who am I to say anything about that? So the argument goes like, hey, it's my body. I get to do what I want with my body. It's my choice. Biblically, as Christians, and I'm talking to Christians, it's clear to passages like Exodus chapter 21 and even, even the fact of Genesis chapter 1 verse 27, that is not just her body. There are two bodies, two DNAs, two blood types, all wrapped up, two sets of fingerprints in her body. And it's not just her body. It's another human made in the image of God. Genesis chapter 1 verse 27 says, in the beginning God created mankind in his image. In his image God made them, male and female. It is abundantly clear that is not just her body in the womb. I think one of the challenges, if you're wrestling with like, well, you know, I'm not really sure where I stand on that. I just want to like uh, give a few suggestions. Here's an acronym on like, hey, just thinking through like, well, what does determine the life of the womb? Because some people be like, well, it's not really a person because it's way too small. Like if there's some threshold and because it's too small, then it's not really a life. And to that, I would just say, what makes the life of someone smaller, less valuable than someone bigger? I have a four-year-old son, two-year-old daughter. Four-year-old son, 38 inches tall, two-year-old daughter, she's a strong 20. Is she less valuable than him? No, that's crazy. And you may go, no, that's silly. Well, just begin to back it up. At what point does size determine someone's value? Or level of development. Maybe you're going, well, they haven't developed, they haven't finished growing, they're not able to have, you know, they're not fully formed, they don't have any teeth yet. At what point does level of development determine someone's value? Is someone who hasn't gone through puberty less valuable? and of less worth than someone who has because they've not developed as much. Or the argument of environment. That hey, the environment, because the child is in the womb of another person or of a mother, that the environment determines that it's less valuable. On what occasion would somebody rationally say the environment in which someone is or exists determines how valuable they are? If they're in the mountains versus on the beach, what would determine What significance does that have towards their value? Location and environment? Maybe the most common one is related to dependency or viability, which is around 22 weeks. So right around this time. 
but dependency. And you're going, well, it's not, you know, it's still her choice, still her body. She still gets to do so because, you know, who am I? She's, the baby's entirely dependent on them. The degree of dependency is crazy. My, I just used my two-year-old daughter. My two-year-old daughter, totally dependent on us. Can't open the fridge, can't give herself food to eat. She, she is totally dependent on another human in her life. And you'd be going, yeah, but they're not like attached and totally in the womb. A one-year-old baby is still entirely dependent on another human. And if it's going to survive, it will require being dependent on someone else. Not just that. When you start getting into the degrees of, hey, if you're dependent, then the person you're dependent on gets to decide whether you live or die. You are playing with some dangerous fire. You're allowing people to say, hey, well, that's a slippery slope towards, you know, they're on a ventilator for their lungs. And technically, you know, I have the ability to decide whether or not I want to have that ventilator plugged in. I have the ability because, you know, I'm around them and they're dependent on some other machine to decide whether or not they have the value and are worthy of life. I have a friend who tragically, his son got bacterial meningitis when he was a year and a half years old and he went from an incredibly blossoming, growing, smart young boy and he went into a coma and his brain fried for the rest of his life. He's now six with the mental capacity of a one-year-old. He may never speak. He will live with his parents. Is his life less valuable because he's dependent than you? you begin to play with some dangerous fire that has some things in common with people that have done some of the most atrocious things in history. And then desirability. That would be the final one. So sled, if you went through all of that, of size, level of development, environment, dependency, and desirability. Maybe the mom doesn't want it. Does that mean that it's not worthy or valuable of life if someone doesn't desire it? I mean, think about the reactions that people have to the same uh, circumstance. A friend calls you, they got pregnant, And you bust out in tears and they're crying in tears and they're afraid and they're not sure what they're going to do. And it's like, if I have the baby, it's social suicide. I don't know what to do. I'm looking for another option to take and you're heartbroken with them. That same friend, two years later, if they were married and they called you and they said, we're pregnant, you're going to be over there. You're throwing balloons. You're doing a gender reveal party. You're going up to the belly, talking to them like, hey, big guy. Because the desirability we've bought determines whether it's worthy of living or not. And the Bible says, it is worthy of life because it is made in the image of God. Second idea of, hey, it's, it's my body. Biblically, again, for Christians, the Bible says it's not your body. It's God's body, and so is the body of the child. 1 Corinthians 6 says, you are not your own. You are bought with a price. Honor God with your body. But as Christians, this is an argument that we cannot embrace or allow or tolerate Again, if you're feeling condemnation that is not from the Lord, that is from an enemy who wants you to feel shame and guilt. As it relates to the idea of, well, it's my body, it's my choice. As Christians, we advocate there are other choices that all of us can make. And I know I'm talking to both guys and girls and the pain involved from you know, past experiences with abortion. There's one in four girls that are involved. There's one in four guys that are part of that as well. But in terms of the choices that are promoted for the Christian faith, there's a few of them. One of them would be don't have sex outside of marriage. We have so, through the sake of like, you know, I'm just going to do whatever I want to do. We have brought and taken sex outside of God's design, which is in the context of marriage to take place. Or sex is designed to take place in the context of marriage, a lifelong commitment and covenant to one another so that when it leads to life, it leads to a celebration. The other option would be, option number two would be to give the baby up for adoption. Listen to me very closely. For every one child, every one baby that is waiting to be adopted, there are 36 families on a wait list. There are people waiting to adopt that will wait years and years, hoping to be picked by the birth mother, and they'll wait years and they'll never be able to adopt. For every 36 families, there's one child. There is such a vast shortage of children or of babies waiting to be adopted. And if you make the decision and you end up finding yourself in that circumstance and it's hard and tragic, and I know it's so, so scary, but many of you, those connected to Watermark and those that we just hear from all the time who have made that decision that I'm going to go through with this, I'm going to give and make an adoption plan take place, I am so proud of you. I am so proud of you. You decided that I'm going to take, because of my conviction, I'm not taking the easy road out, and I am going to let this child live. 
And those of you who didn't, God is not done with you. God loves you. Your sin is no grosser than mine or anyone else's. But the second option of the choice involved could be to give it up for adoption. The third would be to raise the child, to decide I'm going to raise the child in my home. In 2018, Kylie Jenner uploaded a YouTube video called To Our Daughter. She had just found out, or she had just recently given birth to a baby that she had had with the rapper Travis Scott. Inside of the video, she talks about her child, Stormy, that's about to be born. And as we see Kylie go in for the ultrasound with her mother, she hears the heartbeat, and her friend is in the background, and she says this. When you were 20, when you're 20 years old, which is how old Kylie was when she found out she was pregnant, you're just figuring out life. You don't know who you want, or you don't know what you want. You're basically an indecisive teenager. You're just becoming an adult. But there was one thing your mom knew, Stormy, that she wanted, and that was you. In 2019, Kylie told Vogue magazine in Australia, I feel like having a daughter has made me love myself more and I want to be an example for her. The idea that, hey, it's my body, I can do whatever I want, it's my choice, and if you're a male or you're anything, you have no right, or the government has no right to tell me what I can do and what I can't do. The government tells all of us what we can do and can't do all the time. Think about that. There's certain things you can't do right now. Try it on for size and respond with, hey, it's my body, my choice. In other words, leave these doors, go on the highway, take all your clothes off and walk around naked. And when the police show up, say, hey, officer, it's my body, my choice. See how that works. We live underneath the regulations of laws all the time. There's tons of things that you can't do just because it's your body or I can't do because it's my body. When it comes to this issue, the Bible is emphatically clear One of the lies I think that is attached to this is that abortion is an empowering thing to women. And if you want to be fight for women's rights and fight for women, you need to be at least open to, and you know, I kind of see how they get there. And I don't want to be against the, you know, girl squad. And so don't come at me like that. I am all for empowering women. I'm married to a godly, strong woman. I'm the son of a incredibly strong woman. I have a daughter who I hope raises or she comes up and she is incredibly strong and empowered. Abortion does not empower women. If anything, it empowers and allows society and men to get away with sexual irresponsibility, taking advantage of women's bodies without any consequences that are there, or just sexual indulgence on both sides. And we have a culture that celebrates it. In 2019, Michelle Williams stood up at the Golden Globes and she gave a speech. We're receiving this golden statue, the Golden Globe. Here's what she said. I would not have been able to do this, won this award, without employing a woman's right to choose. As she did, she said so to roaring applause in the audience. If that is a life, I want you to think about what she just said. To thunderous applause from a culture, how sad it is. She essentially said, I would not have been able to win this golden statue had I not killed the growing child in my womb. And we have a culture that applauds it and they will hate you and call you anti-woman and call you a misogynist or sexist even if you're a woman and you say, I believe life starts at conception. It may be a part of my story and abortion's part of my past, but God is healing any of that and I still, because God is clear on this, I want to speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves. And our culture sells the lie that this is empowering to women. If anything, it is empowering to Many gross men in society. Harvey Weinstein loves abortion because it allows him to decide, hey, I'm going to sleep around, do whatever I want, and then just give her 500 bucks and get rid of it and treat women like they're a mule. The grossest men in society love abortion because they can abuse, get away with things, and have no consequences. And sadly, there's a feminist, toxic strand of feminism that empowers men like that through fighting for the decision. Empowering women's rights. What about the 50% of children aborted who are women? When it comes to the idea of my body, it's my choice. Scripture is abundantly clear. That is not the case. In 2016, Mother Teresa, I'm sorry, this is 1994. Mother Teresa was invited to the White House. Hillary Clinton was the president, the president's wife. And at the uh, lunch that they were having, Mother Teresa, she's a nun. She was just legend. And, uh, 
and she um, came to the White House. She's meeting with Hillary Clinton. Hillary Clinton asks her, hey, why do you think that we haven't had a woman president yet? Mother Teresa, so savage, doesn't miss a beat. She says, probably because she was aborted. As she was saying, we are ending the life of millions and millions of babies, 60 million since 1973. That's more than Hitler and World War II, Stalin. And again, if you hear condemnation, listen to me as clearly as I can say it. That is not the voice of the Lord. I want to show you when I talk about the choice that's being made, an animation video of the most common way that abortion takes place. It's a video that just displays the most common way. And I, I do this not to be over the top, but it was through powerful images like Emmett Till in the 1950s, and just uh, don't even get lost there, but through seeing what's happening. There's a reason why the concentration camps in Nazi Germany were put outside of Germany because they didn't want the German people to see and know what was going on because they knew if they saw it, if they knew what was going on, they wouldn't be okay with it. And videos like the one we're about to see that's less than a minute long have been basically outlawed in terms of public spaces because the more and more that people see it, the more difficult it is to tolerate and be okay with what's taking place. So, JJ... Show the video. The baby has a heartbeat, fingers, toes, arms, and legs, but its bones are still weak and fragile. The abortionist takes a suction catheter like this one. This is a 14 French suction catheter. It's clear plastic, about nine inches long, and it has a hole through the center. It is inserted through the cervix into the uterus. The suction machine is then turned on with a force 10 to 20 times more powerful than your household vacuum cleaner. The baby is rapidly torn apart by the force of the suction and squeezed through this tubing down into the suction machine, followed by the placenta. Though the uterus is mostly emptied at this point, one of the risks of a suction DNC is incomplete abortion. Essentially, pieces of the baby or placenta left behind. This can lead to infection or bleeding. In an attempt to prevent this, the abortionist uses a curette to scrape a lining of the uterus. The curette is basically a long-handled curved blade. Once the uterus is empty, the spec... That video was easily the most tame of the different trimester abortions that they have. But it is happening every year, and a million children will lose their life to that taking place. So as it relates to, is it a life? The Bible seems to be abundantly clear. Even biology is saying life begins at conception. 95% of biologists agree. My body, my choice. Is that a reasonable argument to allow and not just allow for abortion, it has become a bandwagon and it has become something that is the issue for many people. It's celebrated and it is a tragedy and it is an affront to God. Finally, isn't abortion just the lesser of two evils? I mean, yes, it's an unexpected pregnancy, but why would you have another wrong by bringing a child into the world when the circumstances that led to them being born was rape? Or why would you bring a child in the world when, you know, it's such terrible circumstances and his mom is on drugs and it's just a, a terrible upbringing. He'll have no father system. He'll just end up being, you know, in prison someday. Why would you bring a child into that? Or you can't tell a woman to carry a child and give it up for adoption. You know how emotionally taxing that is? You know how emotionally painful it would be to ask a woman to go nine months and then give a baby up for adoption? It's social suicide. That's crazy. The lesser of two evils, it's not great, but abortion is the lesser of two evils, right? I want to talk about some of these, these cases. Let's talk about the first, the idea of, of rape. Less than a half of a percent of abortions that take place are related to rape. Rape is tragic. If you're sexually abused, if it's a part of your story, God didn't intend that. God can use that. It's not your fault. You're not damaged goods. And there are plenty of men and women who have that a part of their story, and God is healing and using their story for good. Less than half a percent of those who have an abortion are related to rape. The vast, vast, vast majority are related to decisions like Michelle Williams had. But even in those situations where a person does have rape that leads to conception, the Bible would still say 
It's the taking of a life. And if you're in that situation, we can walk alongside you. We want to care for you. We want to come and be there with you every step of the way. We just don't think the death penalty should be given to the baby. The rapist should be arrested and prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law. And if anyone should get the death penalty, it's not the baby. There's some friend of mine that uh, is, you know, when she was actually serving at the porch not long ago, and during one of those situations, she ended up getting raped and she conceived and had a baby. She made the decision to have that child. And now that child attends on Sundays. It goes to Sunday school and she's six years old and she's coloring pictures of Jesus and Moses with other children in the class. How tragic would it have been if in the chorus of people around her who said, man, this is just not right. It's not your baby or it's, you know, every time you see it, you're going to think about him. If she had made that decision and now she's a beautiful girl being raised by a godly father and godly mother. She eventually ended up getting married, has a little brother, and spends her Sundays in Sunday school at church coloring pictures of Jesus because her mom made the decision. It's a life. Some of these are such bad environments. How could we even justify bringing them in. I mean, the world is so broken already. It's almost loving or kind or compassionate to not bring them into the world. I mean, that's worse. Basically, when that argument is made, it's basically saying, hey, some lives, you know, they're not even worth living because that would be such a bad circumstance to bring them up in. One of these lives that was not worth living was born to a woman whose first name, I don't even have it on here, but she had gotten pregnant and she was basically addicted on drugs. She'd gotten pregnant. She'd found herself in a relationship that was toxic. And everyone in her life told her, you should get the abortion. She ended up moving in on government assistance and finding herself in a home. And she carried through and decided to have the child. That woman's name or that woman's child is named Justin Bieber. Who society would have said, you're in a stinking home. You're on government assistance. The father was a drug addict or there's clearly broken service. This is not a loving thing to do. I'm not sure that life is worth bringing in. I don't know Justin, but my guess is he would say, I'm sure glad my mom brought me into this world. It's the idea of, man, it's just too bad of an environment. Who are we to decide that? Too emotionally traumatizing for the mother. Let me move quickly. Hey, it's too emotionally traumatizing to ask a woman to go nine months and to, you know, give the baby up for adoption. I'm not invalidating. That is a difficult, challenging, really hard decision to make. And as the body of Christ, we want to come alongside. We want to care for. We do everything we can to provide care for women. And there's so many resources we'll point you to both in a minute and then after this message. But the trauma of walking through an abortion, statistically, studies show, is far greater than giving and making an adoption plan and giving your child up for adoption. In other words, the least loving thing you can do is encourage, hey, you should have an abortion, not an adoption, because the mental health, the challenges that happen in life skyrocket. Here's what study from CBS News found from the British Cycle, British Journal of Psychiatry when it looked into abortion connection to mental health. It found that women had an 81% increased risk of mental health when it had abortion compared to adoption. The study also found that women who had an abortion were 110% more likely to abuse alcohol, 155% more likely to commit suicide. It concludes, interestingly enough, this completely contradicts the pro-choice narrative that only if women get the abortion they want will they be able to live happy, fulfilled lives. Evidence points to the contrary. It is women who do not get the abortion but give them up for adoption who are more likely to lead healthy, happy lives. Finally, there's a a sentence that I think a lot of us fall into because, you know, as Christians, we're trying to love people. We want to care for people. We want to be compassionate and empathetic to really hard circumstances that I've never walked through or you may never have walked through. And and so sentences like this will be said, like, you know, I wouldn't ever have one, but who am I to say that a woman didn't have this type of right? And, you know, I just, you don't know how hard it's been through and everything that they're walking through. And I don't, and who am I to impose my beliefs on them? And I want to remove that sentence from your vocabulary, not because your attempt in saying so is not from a heart of compassion or a heart of care, I believe that it is. I just believe that it is continuing to be silent on an issue the Bible is emphatically clear on and maybe the greatest moral blind spot in our country's history and certainly the greatest blind spot today. Doing so saying that, you know, I wouldn't, but who am I to say that is essentially the Pontius Pilate argument. Pontius Pilate, you guys know who Pilate is? Pilate was the governor of the time or the area where Jesus, when he lived, hung out, was walked on this earth, He was the governor of that town. Think Greg Abbott, state of Texas. Pilate, Judea. 
And so Jesus was there, ends up getting arrested, going to be crucified. Pretty important. You know that part of the story. He goes and he's put on trial. Who is over the trial? Pilate, this Roman official. Pilate goes, goes up to Jesus. These Jewish people are like, yeah, he's crazy. You should kill him. And Pilate's like, all right, well, hey, they're saying you're crazy. And should I kill you? And Jesus is like, um, no, I've healed people and I brought people back from the dead. And, uh, you know, it goes through his resume. And Pilate's like, I think he's a pretty stand-up guy. I'm not really sure that we should kill this guy. And, uh, but the Jews were like, no, we've got to kill him. He claims to do something. And Pilate makes an infamous decision. He says, I-, I see no reason to crucify this man. But I wash my hands of this thing. Essentially, what Pilate was saying was, I have reservations about whether to take Jesus' life. I'm personally opposed to putting this man on a cross. But who am I to impose my beliefs on others? I'm not going to carry it out. That, that's my personal view. But if others want to, they can. And as Christians, we are not to take that stance when it relates to any issue of injustice, of life, of caring for people. Proverbs 31 says that you and I are called to speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves. It says this in verse 8. Speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves, for the rights of all who are destitute or in need. Speak up and judge fairly. Defend the rights of the poor and the needy. And it says you are to speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves. I don't know a single group in society who cannot more forceful or who cannot at all speak for themselves to a greater degree than the unborn child. And I know this is a tricky topic, and this is not a political thing. This isn't a, a, a Republican thing. This is a Christian. It is a life And we are called to advocate for life. And there's no group that is more at threat. The number one killer of people in America today is abortion. More than cancer, more than heart disease, abortion. The parallels to times in the past where society, because I know this is tricky and and no one around us celebrates it. And that's probably, those are some times where Christians, despite the fact that society and culture is like, no, man, who are you? And you have no right to say that and you stay out of this. Those are often the times where the Christians, despite going against the culture, are in the right. The parallels to the issue of slavery on this one are uncanny. And before you tune out, I want to be very sensitive and very clear on what I mean by that. In 1860, there was a candidate by the name of Abraham Lincoln. You guys know who he ran against? A gentleman by the name of Stephen Douglas. Stephen Douglas, Abraham Lincoln, they ran against each other. They were debating each other for president of the United States. The nation was on the threshold of war over the issue of slavery. Both these two men ran. They both had interesting Uh, platforms that they ran on, part of Stephen Douglas's. That's Lincoln's opponent. You know what part of his thing was? Pro-choice. Not around the issue of abortion. His thing was, hey, look, I personally would not advocate for slavery. You can go back and read the debates between Stephen Douglas, just like we have debates and the craziness that that is right now. You can go read the debates of Lincoln and Douglas, and they talk about this. And and there was a pro-choice era and movement and uh, platform that he ran on. He said, I'm against slavery, but here, it's a big country, got a lot of states. Who am I to say? People in Georgia can't decide whether or not they should have slaves. And Lincoln said, I am, for poor, I am for choice. But when the choice involves something as immoral as slavery, it is wrong. To say that a black person can be chosen by the person who owns them over whether their value is anything other than a human life. To say that if, if the black person is not as valuable as a human life, then sure, choice is involved. But when it comes to a person being a human, being pro-choice about that is not an option. This is a debate that's been going on for a long time. Even the parallels as it relates to culture and society, it was really split. There were some who were like, yes, so for slavery. Others who were like, no, I'm so against slavery. And then there was this huge swath in the middle. Many of them Christians who were like, I'm pretty neutral. I just don't really want to speak out about it. I don't want to be convenient about it. And they were wrong. If you think that you would have stood and fought against slavery... You would have stood and fought against civil rights or for civil rights with Martin Luther King Jr. And you won't fight for the right of the unborn. I just want you to consider, do you think that you really would have? Or would you have been in that middle group where it's neutral and I just, just kind of want to stay out of it? Because as Christians, we are called to speak up on this issue. And the separation of church and state thing, you may be like, yeah, but who am I to impose? Martin Luther King Jr. Nobody ever hates on Martin Luther King Jr., for bringing in his religious beliefs and convictions to say, based on what I believe the Bible teaches, it is wrong for someone to be judged on the content or the color of their skin, not the content of their character. Let justice flow like waters. He quoted from the book of Amos on the steps of the memorial or Lincoln Memorial. And nobody had a problem with it. Christians over and over are called to go against whatever culture says 
if it contradicts the word of God and to raise our voice in the fight for the needs of those who cannot fight for themselves. And I just want you, I want you to really think about that. If you're listening and you won't fight for the rights of the unborn, who are called, well, it's less than human. The parallels to slavery of, hey, you know, it's kind of, they're not exactly on the same, are shocking. Do you really think that you would have fought against Jim Crow? You really think that you would have fought against slavery? Because this is your time. This is your age. This is your era. This is the time for you and I and Christians everywhere to say, we will see abortion end in our generation. We're going to fight for life wound to the tomb. We're going to care for people no matter where they are on the spectrum of life. We're going to care for the immigrant. We're going to care for all people. But there is no group that is being killed at the rate that the unborn is. And society is applauding it and allowing it and fighting for it and enabling it. And it is the most moral blind spot we have ever had. America has more pro-abortion allowance than almost every country on earth. We are some of the most radical as it relates to you can kill a child up to 39 weeks in many places in our country. Think about that. In terms of France, Spain, Germany, the limit is 12 weeks and you've got to go see a counselor for three days to even have it before you can do that. They look at America and they're like, dude, you guys are crazy. We're right there with China, Russia, and North Korea. Are those the nations that you want to be mentioned with? And yet so many Christians, and candidly, because this has been hijacked by this like, oh, women's rights, we've got to stay together, guys. It is an affront to God. I am all for women's rights. And whether you're a man, a woman, black, white, Hispanic, whatever, we've got to come together and say whatever our differences are, we are going to be united on this. In conclusion, what is the application from this? It's a few things. Number one, if this is a part of your story, God isn't done with you, and I just want you to invite, or I want to invite you to recover. We have a ministry here that is entirely devoted to helping you, just like all of us have, have sexual sin in our past and issues in our past where we just need to recover. And there's an entire ministry that's devoted called Life Initiatives. A Life Initiative that's here. It's about abortion, post-abortion care. You can go to watermark.org, type in Life Initiatives. Or you can just email us at info at the porch.live. Email us at info at the porch.live. We'll connect you and you'll find other women there who've walked alongside and God is using their story. He's redeeming it. Some of the most godly women I know have that as part of their story. It doesn't define them. And they are redefining the way that our society and women and people in general understand where life is found, which is in Jesus. It's the first thing we'd be recover. We have volunteers and men and women tonight who are here who have that a part of their story that would love to talk and connect with you. Number two, we gotta pray. We have to hit our knees and pray, God, not just on an election year, but every day and every year. God, will you end abortion in our generation? You've ended the atrocities of slavery in our past. You ended what happened in Nazi Germany. Will you end again what is taking place in our land? It is insanity that a bald eagle egg, if you touch, could cost you $250,000. But if you kill a life in the womb, it is a constitutional right. That is insane. So we got to pray because this is just our nation's conscience is seared as it relates to this. Number three, use your voice. Just like I said, speaking out and knowing where you stand on this issue and advocating for it and raising up our voice, just like they did with bald eagle eggs. We're going to raise up our voice and advocate that legislation happen to protect these. That we would raise up our voice. Number four, vote. Whether this is a part of your story or not, every time that you vote, and by voting in, and this doesn't have any, this is not just the president. This isn't an issue that no matter what happens on November 3rd is going to go away. This is an issue that we have to be people who say, we are going to stand firm on this, and we're going to hold you accountable. And we're going to see that we pass legislation, and life is beginning to win again in America. The generation that is right here, young adults, is beginning to turn the tide on their perspective on, yeah, this is pretty messed up. In 1973 with Roe v. Wade, they didn't have 3D sonograms. They didn't have the ability to go, oh yeah, that baby's smiling at me right now. And now is our time to begin to vote, hold people accountable, and push. This is an issue that cannot be one that we give in on. Number five, if you or someone you know, listen to me very clearly, 
this is me very, very clearly. If you find yourself in a situation where you're pregnant, have an unplanned pregnancy, or you know someone who does, I want you to bring the baby here. You can bring the baby to us. We will take care of your baby. We'll come alongside that person if they just need help and care and they're trying to walk through that. I want you to tell them they can bring the child here. We will take them and walk with them every single step of the way. So if you're like, I don't know what to do. What are even our options? This just feels so crazy. You can tell them or you can know. You can bring the child here. We will care for the child and find a place and help make an adoption plan to find a home for him. And number six, serve. Some of you have the support of your story, you don't. It's just a passion point and there's opportunities we'd love to let you know about. Whether it be through Thrive, which is the ministry that these uh, Meredith and Pharaoh were a part of, that weekly helps women who are in that situation that is such a terrifying one to be in. Help them take the next step in their unplanned pregnancies. Put together an adoption plan. Put together a plan for care and walk alongside of them. Maybe you serve in that or maybe you serve in Life Initiative. But this is a part of your story. You, if you're a follower of Jesus and it's there, you have no idea how powerful your story is to other women who feel covered in shame, covered in guilt, covered without hope, and you and your testimony of God's goodness, despite all of our messed up decisions and despite your story, is like a key that unlocks the shame and guilt and pain of people. And you can serve in Life Initiative and share and use your mess to be a message for Christ. In conclusion, I, I've said, and I'm about to end, I've said a lot that if you hear condemnation and shame and guilt, I want you to listen to me abundantly clear. That is not from the Lord. How do I know that? There's actually a moment in John chapter 8, we talked about before, where it's a woman who's in sexual sin. And Jesus' response gives us some indication to how he respond to you, and whether you just look to pornography, whether he respond to you as it relates to abortion or sexual sin with your boyfriend or girlfriend. It gives us how he responds to broken, messed up people. It's a woman who had been caught having sex with another man's wife or another man who wasn't her husband. Think about that moment. Somebody busts in the door and they find this woman who's having sex with a man who's not her husband and they drag her half naked, they throw her in front of Jesus in front of them and this group surrounds Jesus who's in the temple teaching. They throw this woman down and they say, Jesus, we caught this woman in sexual sin, sleeping with the man who is not her husband. The law says we should condemn her. She should have the death penalty. What do you say? What would the Son of God say to your worst moment? I mean, you, you get caught having an affair with a guy who's married, that's a bad moment. What would Jesus, God in a bod, perfection in sandals, walking on the planet, eye to eye with this woman, what would he say? He bends over and he begins writing in the ground. So that after a couple minutes, he stands up and he says to this crowd of men and this terrified woman, on the ground, half clothed, disheveled, ashamed. He says, whoever has no sin, let them throw the first stone. After a moment, the men begin to leave. It says from the oldest to the youngest. And then it's just Jesus and the woman. And he bends back down, the text tells us, and he lifts up her face and says, woman, where are your accusers? Does no one condemn you? And the woman looks around and realizes it's just her and Jesus. And she says, no one. And Jesus responds, neither do I. Go and sin no more. He looks at a woman who had the equivalent of an abortion or adultery or pornography or sexual sin that's in my life. And he looks right her in the eyes and says, I don't condemn you. I don't condone what you did, but I don't condemn you. And I am calling you forward, go and sin no more, child. Whatever you have done, whatever sin you think puts you beyond the length of God's love, you have bought a lie. And Jesus would say to you, if that's a part of your story, the condemnation and guilt that you feel is not from him if you're a follower of Christ. He has paid for it. That doesn't define you. You have been washed and cleaned in his love and by him and by his love, by what he did on the cross. And you can walk free in that. And we can all together look around at society and say, man, we don't condemn what you have done. We don't condone it. And we are calling us as a nation 
this has got to end. Whatever circumstance, whatever brokenness, or whatever challenge, or whatever you think is like too far beyond God's reach, or whatever circumstance you're in right now, there is nothing that has been possible for God to turn around and use for good. No matter how bad things look, he can take the most crazy unplanned pregnancy and use it for incredible, incredible good. How do I know that? Because the greatest act in human history was connected to an unplanned pregnancy. Think about this. I don't know over the greatest act in history. There was a young girl named Mary, 16 years old, realizes despite the fact that she's engaged, never had sex with anybody, she's pregnant. Angel shows up and says, you're going to give birth to the son of God. How did that conversation go with her mom? Yeah, mom, I'm pregnant. No, we didn't do it. No handsy, no nothing. An angel. Yeah, that, that, that. Joseph didn't go so well because Joseph, who she was engaged to, decided, man, clearly you've cheated. People don't just get impregnated out of the blue. So I'm, I'm out. Until an angel shows up and says, she is with child who will be the savior of the world. An unplanned pregnancy that caught them totally off guard. They had no idea what was coming, but God did. Every unplanned pregnancy that catches anyone totally off guard, they had no idea what was coming, is one that God did. And he could take it, and just like he did in that situation, take even the most surprising, confusing, terrifying circumstances and use it for your good. He's already done it. But what he did with his son, he gave his life and paid for all of our sins. Every sin in your past and my past and your future and my future, all of it paid for. And we receive that by trusting. You paid. You paid. You paid for me. And now we go advocate and we speak for those who can't speak for themselves. Let me pray. Father, I pray for anyone right now who they just have never experienced freedom from the pain and the shame, that you would be louder than any feelings of condemnation that they feel, that they would hear your grace and your forgiveness and you call them by name and you love them, you died for them, you're crazy about them, you're not done with them, you've forgiven them, that those would ring loudly. I pray for any person who listens to this and finds himself in that situation of an unplanned pregnancy, that they would take the steps that are in line with your word and they would walk through either giving the child, making an adoption plan or raising the child and you would have them walk with that child in a full relationship with you for a full life. Father, would you end abortion in our generation? Would you put in office men who don't just say they're for pro-life, but they are pro-life. And would you capture the hearts and save men and women who refuse to do so? Would you awaken our country's conscience to this blind immorality that is currently amongst us? And would you help us as your church to be winsome, engaging, courageous, and loving as we do so and use our voice and point people to the one who saves all people, who created all people, and who gives offer of eternal life and abundant life now and forever. In Christ's name, amen.